Hi there, big fan of the show. Um, I'm a, uh, I just had a question for you because I recently discovered the r slash Apple podcast and I am a avid user of the um, service book too, which is the Microsoft um, MacBook Pro competitor. And I have actually been looking with iPad OS and uh, the possibility of new iPad hardware of replacing that. So I was just wondering um, what your guys' take on the possibility of that would be for someone who mainly just edits photos, audio, sometimes video, but mainly just writes a lot. Thanks. Okay. Um, I think you're most qualified to answer the idea of using an iPad Pro as a, a full computer replacement. How's that been working for you? Yeah, well, everything that he's mentioned there, I use the iPad for all the time. So I do heaps of photo editing, um, a, a small amount of video editing, uh, I guess a little bit of writing and uh, had plenty of audio editing. Obviously, I'd, this show is produced uh, on my iPad with Ferrite. It's recorded with Ferrite and edited with Ferrite and posted with the Anchor app. So it's all done on there. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's way better for audio editing than I ever found Logic Pro to be. Um, photo editing, I mean, you've got Lightroom, basically almost an equivalent to the desktop version of Lightroom. So if you're happy to pay... But even you don't even have to pay a subscription. Uh, you can just edit JPEGs um, on the free version. Um, but if you pay, you can edit RAW, and you get most of the Lightroom features. I think like probably ninety five percent of them. Uh, and there are other good photo editing apps like um, Pixelmator Photo, which came out a couple of months ago. And uh, if, if you're not like a fan of subscriptions, then you just pay the once off fee. It's not even that much. I can't remember, but I don't know, maybe ten dollars. Um, and uh, basically all my photo needs are taken care of by Pixelmator Photo. Um, I don't do a lot of writing, but it seems to be the perfect device for that uh, because you can clear away a lot of the distractions that you'd have on a normal uh, user interface on like a desktop computer or on Windows. I mean, I can't really say how Windows is like because I haven't used it in a while, um, especially not seriously. But... Um, I certainly hear of a lot of um, Apple bloggers who use the iPad primarily to to write all their articles. Did I cover off everything? Uh, uh, And video, yeah, of course, video. I don't think there's any real equivalent to the the big photo apps on the iPad, but just for your basic tasks, um, well, for the the very basic tasks, you can just use iMovie, which is okay. Uh, and then for anything more advanced, you've got Luma Fusion, which is very powerful. You could pretty much do anything you want on there. Um, so, in summary, for the uh, for the criteria that you've given us, I would say the iPad Pro is a perfect device. Um, David, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I think for the use case that that it's been defined here. The iPad Pro is, is um, an even better option than his current Surface Book, uh, just because of the apps you mentioned. I think that editing, especially photos and and even video and audio, uh, is much more comfortable experience on something like an iPad, where you can actually touch your content. And I actually prefer using the Apple Pencil to fine tune things versus a mouse i think it feels i don't know more precise to me that way i'm sure someone who's had more experience working on desktop would say the opposite though um as far as typing goes if you have to write something do you just use the on-screen keyboard or do you have a a bluetooth keyboard you use i do have a a a keyboard um but if i'm (laughs) if i'm actually kind of write anything that's more than a few words I actually just dictate it so you probably put me in a niche there of people oh, right. who, who enjoy dictation because uh, and I've only just come across this recently as well um, maybe because I moved from uh, a physical keyboard you know with a, a MacBook 2 an on-screen keyboard and I yeah I really like it uh, it gets better as you use it so if you've just used it once or twice and you find that the dictation isn't very good well keep using it and when it gives you the little squiggly underline of like a did you mean this and you tap it and get the suggestions it actually seems to learn it and um 
I mean, I know I shouldn't be surprised, but I am surprised that I actually learned it and eventually it will work out like when you spell out acronyms, which it's typically been ter- terrible at, it will start getting your acronyms and uh, any sort of specific lingo that isn't quite, you know, typical English uh, related to whatever job you're doing. Um, so, yeah, mm-hmm. dictation all the way. Uh, I have the keyboard folio and... I find it extremely comfortable, although I really like uh, low-travel keyboards. I know a lot of people find them uncomfortable. Uh, So if you like keyboards with minimal travel, you'll probably find the keyboard folio case is a good fit. Otherwise, you can use any Bluetooth keyboard if that's what you're more comfortable with, and that would work fine as well. As a matter of fact, you can use a wired keyboard too if there's a really nice mechanical keyboard that you couldn't give up using. So I think there's tons of options as far as writing goes on the iPad as well. And uh, with, with with iOS 13 coming later, we'll even have mouse support, if that's your jam. It might make transitioning from a Surface to an iPad a bit easier if you, if you can use a mouse. Did you see that they've refined the, the mouse support in Beta 3 of iPad? Yeah, the cursor, well, this is all I saw, the cursor can be made smaller. It was kind of horrendously big before. Um, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So it looks like it can be used a little bit more like a mouse. And I think you could change, maybe it was the color of the cursor as well. So slightly more customizable in that way. Uh, yeah. And it sounds like they're listening to feedback. So that's a good sign for mouse support in the future. Here's one thing I don't think we've mentioned in any of the previous shows since WWDC is that with the mouse support, you can map functions to say if you've got a mouse with like 13 buttons on it you can map all those buttons to certain gestures or features or or whatever yeah right. it's pretty nice although now it's made me think like oh i was planning to use my magic mouse with it maybe it'd be better to get like a gaming mouse uh i know at work i actually i use a gaming mouse uh exclusively for the extra buttons Um, like I have the normal left, right, center click, and I have forward and back navigation on the side of the mouse, but I also have a button on the mouse that pulls up like the windows equivalent of expose. So I can easily switch, uh, windows. If there's one hidden behind another, uh, I have a button on there that dismisses all the, uh, windows. So I get to the desktop really quickly and then bring them back up. Uh, I have a button on there that quickly pulls up an explorer window and one that locks my computer when I walk away. Cause if I don't lock my computer when I walk away, uh, one of my coworkers is going to post in the group slack that I'm buying everyone appetizers at the next team lunch. <laughs> and at that point it's kind of obligatory that you have to buy appetizers. So, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, does the iPad pro support, if you use a magic mouse, does it recognize the different touch gestures that the magic mouse can support? Uh, I believe I've read that it does, um, but my iPad's still on um, iOS 12, so I haven't tested it yet. I'll be sure to report back as soon as I find out for sure. So you've upgraded your phone, but you're just hesitant to update the iPad. I'm very hesitant to update my iPad because uh, if it wasn't my primary device, then sure, it would get an update. But uh, since I rely on it so much, it's not going to get it. Whereas my phone is kind of the secondary thing i don't use it all the time actually i don't use it a lot at all so right it copped the update um but so far so good i've encountered very few bugs it's just about as mm-hmm. fast as it was um and be- being i'm on public beta one uh, i'm not too worried about this the tiny sort of speed decrease i'm sure it'll get better mm-hmm Developer Beta 3 seems to have increased the speed a lot. Oh, nice. Okay. I'll look forward to Public Beta 2. And, of course, the thing I was most looking forward to is present, which is that I can long press on notifications and get quick quick actions now instead of having to swipe them. Oh, right. (laughs) (laughs) So, finally, that feature has made its way back to the older device after nonsensically not being there. (laughs) I don't know if it's fixed in Developer Beta 3 yet. I haven't checked. But so far, the only real bug that's been hindering me in this beta is connectivity. Uh, I can't connect to my my car's uh, dash cam, which I think I said. 
uh, in the past, but I also can't connect to like my network's Wi-Fi printer to print things wirelessly. I can't, um, like I bought some new smart switches or smart plugs for my house and I'm trying to get those set with home home kit, but I can't connect to them to set them up right now. So there seems to be a lot of connectivity issues, but I haven't tried it since the new beta. Hopefully those are resolved. Yeah. Okay. There have been a lot of reports of connectivity issues, maybe something to do with the new security settings. I'm not sure. I think that's exactly what it is, is, uh, some apps aren't asking for permission to connect when they should. As a matter of fact, and this, this is going to sound like I'm a trader. I bought a Google home hub the other day and, uh, I was trying to set that up with my phone. Um, and I had the Google home app and, uh, it was requesting me to grant the app permission to use my Wi-Fi network. Um, so they could pair the home hub and update it. But it like the app itself was saying, you need to give me permission, but iOS wasn't prompting me to give permission. And if I went to the home hubs settings in the settings app, there was no toggle either. So it just would not give me the option to give it permissions. And I had to use uh, an older phone that wasn't on the beta to get it set up. One of your many, many older phones that you have now. (laughs) Yeah. Thanks to you in the last show mentioning the possibility of having an iPhone collection. I went out and bought a bunch of them. I was surprised when I was looking into it, how cheap they were. I could get most of the phones for like less than 20 bucks. So I have everything from the original iPhone through the 5S now and an SE. Um, Because surprisingly, you can get an iPhone SE for less than a 6 and 6S. Um, I guess because, I don't know, maybe the person selling it just didn't realize that an SE was worth more or equivalent to a success so so you're the you're the proud owner of an iphone se that's amazing i do have an se yeah it's a it's a nice phone it's a great phone isn't it um any plans to use it surprising to me as well no 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 it's gonna sit on my shelf as a matter of fact uh, as a matter of fact i i bought a version of SE that like works on uh, some carrier that I've never even heard of before. Um, Cause I have no intentions of actually using it. It's going to sit on the display shelf. All right. You guys still have carrier locks, but I was uh, some, some carriers do still have locks, like not hard, like not impossible to remove locks, but like you have to go into the carrier and get them to physically remove it from right, the phone. Right, okay. Um, and this is a carrier that I've never heard of. <laughs> so there's definitely not one around here. Uh, before we get any farther, uh, I want to say thanks, Maximilian, for the message. And if anyone else is interested in sending us a voice message, there should be a link in the show description. It's an anchor voice message, and we'll be happy to hear your feedback. Yeah, I'll try and make sure there is a link this time. I think I said there was one last time, and then there wasn't. Was there not? Yeah. Oh, n- no. Uh, there was. My understanding is that Anchor puts it in automatically. Yeah, that's what I thought too, but I had a look, and there was nothing there. Interesting. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> Should we start the show? Yeah, let's do it. Hopefully I picked some good topics for us. Good morning, Mr. Topic Chooser. Good morning, James. <laughs> Believe it or not, this is the first time in a year and a half that I've actually picked the topics we're going to talk about. <laughs> well, really, the, the Apple community picks the topics for us, right? We're just the, the moderators of the topics that were chosen by them. That's right, yeah. This is just the first time I actually went to the subreddit and copied the top posts <laughs> into our show notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we get into the topic, though, I just want to mention that the Apple subreddit now has a million subscribers. We hit that sometime in the last week, uh, which is pretty cool. It's huge. It's um, it's not as big as the Nintendo Switch subreddit, but hey, I'll take one million. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. All right. So our first topic of the show and probably the biggest news of the last couple of weeks, uh, Johnny Ive has announced his departure from Apple in the coming months is this one of those things where you can ask um 
where were you when you heard the news? I know exactly where I was. Um, <laughs> so yes, uh, yeah, um, I was sitting at my desk at work, and I got the Apple News notification that said Johnny Ive is leaving Apple, and it, I mean it was it was kind of a clickbait headline the way it was worded, uh, but I immediately got up. There's there's one other person in my office that cares about Apple stuff at all. And he's also a vintage computer collector like I am. So I ran over to his desk. I'm like, have you seen this? <laughs> um, and his response was, eh, I didn't like the new Mac Pro design. Anyway. <laughs> of which I would say Johnny had very little part. <laughs> Probably. Although, yeah, I think we mentioned in the last show that it was based off of a concept design for the G4 Cube. Right, okay. Yeah, good. Uh, I just want to mention that you said the headline is clickbait. Uh, isn't it just stating the fact, like word for word? I I guess it was. Just Johnny Ive is leaving Apple. Sounds a little more extreme than Johnny Ive is still going to work for Apple, but under his own company instead. I would take that over. Guess which top exec is leaving Apple after. 30 years <laughs> or 20, 20. fair <laughs> yeah I, I guess that's fair <laughs> so he's moving on though but then I also to start uh, right, a, a yeah. company horrendously named uh, I, my personal opinion love from no spaces capital L capital F I agree that was my first thought too is like that's a terrible name for a company why not just call it like Johnny Ive Incorporated or Ive Design? Clearly not very imaginative, but uh, I know Love From doesn't do it for yeah. me. Love From Johnny. It's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like Deal With It's comment. Uh, headline in 2024, Apple buys startup Love From for $2 billion. <laughs> Which is funny. That's basically what I texted you when I found out. I'm like, this is going to be a Steve Jobs next situation, and they're going to buy his company mm-hmm. in, in five or ten years. So I don't think we'll actually see that, though. Uh, design is so subjective, and Apple is, is definitely going to be able to get by with a different designer. You know, they didn't have Johnny... 30 years ago and they they I don't want to say we're just doing just fine because 30 years ago they were on the brink of bankruptcy but they were a very successful company in the past without Johnny and I'm sure they can do that again yeah I'd be surprised if if this happened if they ended up buying love from because uh, my my take on it is that Johnny is leaving the company because it's he's kind of reached the end of or he's achieved what he's wanted to achieve there isn't like a whole lot more he could probably do in technology and in apple's kind of areas um and then on the other hand apple buys companies for the people most of the time Mm -hmm. so why would they buy love from to bring johnny back if johnny seemingly doesn't want to be there anymore that part of it wouldn't make sense but who knows 2024 is a long time away (laughs) Yeah, it's not not quite the same. Like they're not firing Johnny. He's just doesn't want to work there anymore. Yeah. <laughs> he made that clear in 2015 when he moved to England, I would say. Yeah. I yeah, I was about to say this is this isn't really a surprise. Uh he's said vocally in the past that he's burnt out and that he wants to design other things and he's done small side projects in the past. Um, and I think even, even just the way he positioned the Apple watch, like he's like, I really don't want to design a piece of technology. I want to design some kind of fashion item. And he tried to pitch the Apple watch that way, which clearly didn't end up panning out for him. Uh, yeah. I don't think it really mattered too much that it didn't, that didn't pan out. I think it was just the, the, the part of the Apple watch project that he was interested in that, that kind of made it his project. Um, and from what I've read that, that part of the Apple Watch, the edition, was kind of at odds to what other Apple Watch execs like um, Jeff Williams and uh, Jeff Williams rather 
uh, wanted to do. Is it Jeff William or Williamson? Right. I think it's Williams. Yeah, okay. Now you've got me second guessing myself. Yep. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I mean, his big achievement was Apple Park, and I think that after that was completed and it's been officially opened to the public, uh, I think they had their official opening. I mean, it was just a few months ago, wasn't it? Even though they've been working there for a couple mm-hmm. of years now. So uh, now that that's officially done. I think it's. I think it was just time for him to move on. So you're naming the Apple Park over things like the iMac, iPod, iPhone, the iPad, the MacBook. I'm not saying that that was the, his pinnacle achievement. I'm saying that was his his new project at Apple that got him away from technology. Uh, okay. Now that it's over, he's moving on to find now something else. Now I follow. All right. <laughs> Although Apple Park is extremely impressive and arguably more so than a laptop in my mind. Yeah, it's it's probably going to last um, like the test of time a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure what sort of legacy it's going to leave compared to something like the original iMac, though. That's true. Yeah, I mean, Apple Park is not quite as iconic, uh, but at the same time is, is uh, very impressive. That, and he's been working on uh, designing Apple stores recently. Some of the newer Apple stores were his designs. Um he even designed a stage I think Lady Gaga performed on uh, at Apple Park for like an employee appreciation ceremony. So he's clearly trying to branch out and find other things to design that weren't wasn't just technology at Apple. It's going to be interesting to see uh, how Apple and Love from a um, work together in the future. Uh, how much is Apple actually mm-hmm. going to use this company? I mean. You can say that, you know, Johnny's starting this company and they're going to consult to Apple, but is that just a way of smoothing over this transition? Is it really going to happen or is it just going to be That's... like a phone call every month just to, to check in and see how you're doing? That is, that is really how I read it. It's like they're just saying this to not make stockholders freak out. You're like, no, no, he's actually still going to help us. Don't don't worry about him leaving, uh, but I think he's definitely moving on. And maybe maybe they can call and ask questions every once in a while. But I don't think that he's going to have a a big hand in design moving forward. Oh, we forgot which degree to champ for the edges. Can you just remind us again, please, Johnny? <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how it goes at yeah companies I've worked for before. You end up calling like previous employees and asking the most inane questions sometimes. But anyway. I'm sure Apple isn't doing that. Uh, it, it's cool that um, the way that Johnny joined Apple is that he was working for a company uh, called Tangerine and he was kind of designing uh-huh. the the original power books for Apple uh, while working for this company and then Apple bought the company and that's how Johnny came on board. Um, so it would be a case of history repeating itself if if a deal with its uh, prophecy comes true. <laughs> I think uh, equally interesting to Johnny leaving is uh, how obvious it is that Jeff Williams is being positioned as the next successor to Tim Cook. Oh, yeah. Or at least next. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, as COO, I think COO is like Apple's. I don't know. It's it's like COO means like next in line for the position. And... uh, now that Jeff Williams is is uh has two uh well Alan Dye and Evan Evans Hankey are both reporting to him as software and hardware uh design respectively now. Um I think that we're gonna see good things now that software is being separated from hardware. And more Jeff Williams on stage, which I'd never complain about because I do like his presentation style. Uh, it's it's not quite mm-hmm. Craig or Phil, but it's certainly a step better than Tim's ever was. I think I'd take Jeff over Phil even. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like the last time I really enjoyed Phil Schiller on stage was in 2013 when they unveiled the Mac Pro and he said, can't innovate anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Which came back to bite him and I think ever since then he's been a little less cocky on stage 
Uh, there's something about him. I've got a soft spot for to, for Phil. Yeah, I mean Phil's been around a really long time, and uh, done good work. There have been some great videos of really old Apple keynotes on um, presentations involving Johnny, Phil, and um, and of course Steve Jobs. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, it's amazing they they look straight out of the 80s, yet they're presenting in the 90s. I mean, uh-huh. The hairstyle, the clothes, it's its all horrendous. And and just the style of the presentations is just so different to what we have now. Like, like literally someone standing at a, um, at a, uh, a lecture stand, whatever they're called, and, and just talking for like this five minutes solid. Imagine that these days. Uh-huh. So did you see the video of Johnny showing off like some of his concept flat panel monitor? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And he was showing off this stand that is very reminiscent of the new Pro Display XDR stand, but it has this the mechanism in it to effortlessly adjust the angle and height and all of that. Um, it sounded very much like what we have today. Yeah, right. It was just a whole lot uglier back then. It kind of clamped to your desk. I think he described it as spring-loaded or something like that. And the way they unveiled it, but they had like the CRT shell sitting over it. He's like, now imagine if it looked like this. And he picked up the CRT shell and there's a flat panel. Uh-huh. <laughs> the showmanship. <laughs> All expenses spared. Oh, they're coming up with that CRT shell, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But anyway, I don't think, I don't think this is going to be as bad as some people made it out to be. Uh, and a second part of this that, um, we haven't covered yet is all of the the doomsday people like there was a wall street journal article recently that was talking about how johnny hasn't really been part of the company for like the last four years and he completely checked out and then i think that was the article that prompted tim cook to send an email out saying like no this is none of this is true and we know johnny and you know uh, he's been fully committed this whole time yeah, right. The the Wall Street Journal article did make it seem like uh, it was just a complete mess inside the company, and then Tim's Cook, Tim Cook's word was that it was absurd. So, yeah. right. Who do you believe? Someone inside the company who sees it probably... firsthand, <laughs> but is also the CEO, and has uh, kind of has yeah, to but... say positive things about it. <laughs> but yeah, uh, right. You do just get the sense that uh, if Doomsday was it was um, upon us when when Johnny left then we probably would have already started seeing it maybe in 2015 when he first started the process of checking out yeah and there's some people that said even as far back as he checked out when Steve Jobs died and uh, I find that hard to believe I I do as well and I think if anything he might have gotten too overzealous when Steve Jobs died Uh, because everything that I've read in the past is that Steve Jobs, to an extent, kept Johnny in check. Uh, and without someone around to to just say no to some of his ideas, I think that uh, things could have gotten off the rails a bit. Uh, I'm not saying like the, necessarily the MacBook Pro keyboard is, is his fault, but when you're the chief design officer, kind of the blame definitely goes to you when there's a history of failure with these keyboards the last few years. The truth comes out. His head is actually on the chopping block for the MacBook Pro keyboard. <laughs> and that is why he's left this the is company. Like, this is like Apple Maps. And they fired Scott Forrestal. This is how they're making up for the keyboard. We're getting rid of Johnny. Everything's going to be better now. <laughs> We've solved it. That's it. End of the show. Yeah. Um, I'll take press calls later. <laughs> And, you know, Scott Forstall and Johnny famously never got along, so maybe now Scott Forstall can come back. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that would be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> I always liked Scott, uh, but it sounds like he was not easy to work with. So Yeah, he sounded like the, the real protege of Steve Jobs in his attitude towards everyone else. Yeah. Yeah, I really did. <laughs> so, but clearly, I mean, even Steve thought that that's not what the company needed because he handpicked Tim Cook to 
continue on after him. So I don't think even Steve thought he was as good as him, I guess. I don't know. Apple moves Mac Pro production to China from U.S. And the Mac Pro was famously uh, one of the only products that Apple manufactured 100% in the U.S., I think in a, a Texas facility. Um, I assume this has to do with just manufacturing costs. Uh, and it's not really a surprise. Um I wonder if this means that Apple anticipates having a higher demand and so they need a bigger production facility than they can put together in Texas. Or maybe less demand and they really need like the economy of uh, having cheap labor in China. I suppose that's possible as well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't think the 2013 Mac Pro sold very well at all, but... hmm. I want to thank um, Closing Bell in the comments for just posting the entire article and uh, and found for uh, giving the tip that if you access a... Um, actually, it was a Wall Street Journal. If you access their articles via Twitter, then you can read it, um, like getting mm-hmm. past the paywall that way. I actually couldn't get that link to work for me. Um, when this was posted five days ago, and I was on mobile, maybe that's the difference... I was able to read the article from the Twitter link, but now that I'm on desktop and I try navigating through Twitter, it still gives me the subscribe to read the full story. Huh, okay. It worked all right for me. I only went there once, though. Oh, okay. Maybe second time is not the charm. (laughs) Well, are you on an iPad or are you on a desktop? iPad. I mean, I assume that it doesn't make a difference, but that's the only difference for me is I'm on a desktop now. So maybe the thermal corner that they were stuck in was actually Austin, Texas. <laughs> That's what they meant this whole time. The the heat issues was yeah. actually the environment around the factory. And they just really needed to get out of there. <laughs> um, so yeah. I'd never really read much into the, the US manufacturing of the Mac Pro, but since this news come out, mm-hmm. came out, I have been doing a bit of reading. And by all reports, it was kind of a shit show. Uh, so Flex is the company that was um, manufacturing it, and um, I mean, he, he's a uh, from um, Go Sharks in the comments. Uh, so I've worked with Flex to manufacture things first, starting in Dallas and then moving to Shenzhen. The the labor and overhead in Dallas cost more than than the entire cost per device in China. Uh, another quote: uh, As soon as the shift ended. Many headed out, even leaving lines still running. Um, mm-hmm. uh, once the demand for the trash can Mac Pro ended, the, the company kind of just shifted towards refurbishing Mac Pros instead and, and laid off a ton of the workforce. So, <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> the idea that when your shift is over, you leave <laughs> is, uh, is more of of a a western thought or an eastern i don't know western thought i guess and uh less dedication to the job i guess i don't know (laughs) i mean that makes perfect sense to me it's like yeah my shift is over i'm gonna leave uh but i guess uh that definitely does hurt your bottom line especially when labor is so much more expensive it it did make it sound like the like the shift bell ended and they just literally stood up and walked away without even putting their Mm -hmm. tools away but that's just (laughs) guessing um i don't know maybe like the job security concerns that i just get the feeling exist in china don't don't really exist there that that would be how it is in australia at least Uh, you know if you leave work on time you don't really fear for your job right yeah my understanding is with at least companies like foxconn in china it's like if you're a worker for foxconn you live in a, like a dorm at Foxconn and that's all you do is work and then sleep. Uh, which I mean, it's, it's not an ideal living condition. It's pretty crappy, but with how much cheaper labor is in countries like China, I mean, there's, there's a bigger social issue to solve here than we're going to, we're going to work out in the course <laughs> of this show. 
Uh, but yeah, with just how much cheaper it is, I mean, it's, there's no surprise that every company manufactures in, in China or Taiwan or something similar. Um, something interesting I read just about the about custom built IMAX at the moment is that uh, some of the work's actually done in Ireland. I was very interested to hear that. Oh, I, really? Yeah, I had no idea. I mean, Apple famously, <laughs> quote unquote, hides their money like in Ireland, so. uh-huh. <laughs> which I think Ireland is one of those havens for big corporations because of tax laws or something over there. Uh, yeah, I've certainly heard that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think you might be able to count Facebook, maybe not now, but in the past as, as headquartering there. Yeah. Which I guess that might make sense. They maybe have to have some kind of facility in Ireland to be able to claim those. So maybe they just have like, yeah, we'll just refurbish some computers over there and then we can send all our money that way. <laughs> and of course, there were jokes about the IMAX coming out of Ireland being shoddy as hell because Irish <laughs> people just have that reputation. <laughs> They're sorry. all drunk while fixing Sorry, computers. Irish listeners, yeah. <laughs> There's that iMac that came with like the smell of Guinness through it. <laughs> I just made that up, of course. Um, so the new Mac Pro is going to be manufactured by Quanta, which is the company that currently manufactures the MacBook Pro, MacBook Air, and the Apple Watch. So it's certainly going to be in experienced hands. Um, a company that's existed since 1988 and just sounds like a massive Chinese manufacturer, although I hadn't heard of them uh, before this. Yeah, I hadn't either. <laughs> Foxconn is kind of the big name I always heard. And, uh, I mean, this news is a little surprising for me. Maybe not. I'm not in any position to understand economics. Like, I took a couple low-level economics classes at university to satisfy some base-level requirements. Um, But uh, I know there's either already or potentially higher tariffs looming based on our current i don't know what's going on right this is the other part of the story that yeah there's all these reports about oh we have to move manufacturing out of china because it's a risk um i say we but of course it doesn't affect me at all but right but it seems like the cost of importing the materials from other countries it actually costs more than making the product in their countries and importing it now yep. so it kind of had the opposite effect <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's 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 things are not going well right now it, it is truly amazing how cheap labor is in china yeah it offset the cost of anything else just for how cheap the labor is um there are manufacturing apples some of apples manufacturing in the other um what do they call them? Emerging markets, uh, Brazil, mm-hmm. India, China, and uh, I'm not sure if Russia's counted amongst them. Can't imagine there's going to be much manufacturing there. No, I don't think so. <laughs> um, but yeah, you do hear sporadic reports about manufacturing um, iPhones in Brazil. I uh, can't remember what's coming out of India, but but yeah, considering you guys' uh, economic uh, situation at the moment, I. I wouldn't be surprised if those <laughs> avenues are being pursued even more aggressively. Yeah, I'm sure. But yeah, again, I don't I don't claim to know anything about the economics or the even the letter of how these new tariffs are spelled out, so So this this post is four days old, but its uh original iPhone was released on this day in two thousand seven. Uh do you remember when the iPhone came out? Hmm. Do I remember? I my memory doesn't go back that far. It's, it's you just can't like, remember anything from 2007. <laughs> <laughs> don't think I can. No. I I I don't remember anything making a big impact in my memory. No, I remember certain things. I remember uh, a friend wanting me to order them the new iPhone because it didn't come out that's probably why it's not like a massive impact in my memory so it wasn't ever released in australia uh, as far as i know the, the original iphone so you had to bring it here and jailbreak it and right. then do like some uh install some, some some things that exploited the baseband to get it to work on the australian phone networks 
Um, so I certainly remember that mm-hmm. part of it, but I do not remember the announcement of it. It wasn't until the iPhone 3G and 3GS that I like really became interested in having one. Mm-hmm. And then I think the first time I realized it was actually a big thing was the iPhone 3GS uh, release day. I was actually in... Um, I think I was in at the... Out, uh, across the road from the Oahu Apple store and there was like a massive line out the front. I was like, what is that? What are they all lining up for? And then it dawned on me and then I realized like, oh, wow. The iPhone's actually a pretty oh, big man. thing. <laughs> uh, I didn't see it live. I don't even know if... I, I'm sure Apple wasn't streaming keynotes back then. Um, but I did hear about it soon afterwards and... Uh, I was obsessed with with the iPhone when it came out. It was it was so clearly the future and it just it seemed like magic seeing it work. And uh I remember I mean back then this is cool and Apple should still do this. They used to make like little instructional videos on how to use features of your products. Do you remember that? I still do that. I mean this is like if you went to their website, went to the iPhone tab, there's like how to make a phone call on iPhone, how to how to use maps, how to send an email. I mean, you don't need something that basic, but it was like just a stream of videos down the the page and how to do different features of your of their products. Okay. No, I only know the current ones that they they post on YouTube. They've they seem to have the, like this one oh, okay. uh woman who kind of does them all. Uh, yeah. Mm. Uh, I I'm probably making it seem bigger than it is. There've probably been 3 in the last 3 years, but it's always this one chick who always like takes you through the new features. Like this is how you unlock your iPhone 10, blah blah blah. Oh, okay. So maybe they do some similar stuff still. Uh, but I used to watch those. Like every single day I'd go to the website and watch them. And it just, it seemed so, I don't know, futuristic. I was i was in middle school at that point. I was in the seventh grade when it came out. Um, and I mean, this was like way beyond anything I could afford. And so it was just kind of this, like not even real thing to me. Uh, I did get an iPod Touch soon after, though, which kind of scratched that itch. Uh, but that really kicked off my, like, really closely following Apple was when the iPhone came out. And after that point, I always either watched the keynotes uh, live when I could or s- watched things like Mac Rumors for their live updates on, on keynotes. And I would, uh, yeah make youtube videos about them that's how i started my YouTube <laughs> channel so was your first ever phone an iphone then no my first phone was do you remember the chocolate lg chocolate mm, mm, no i don't think so <laughs> it might have been just a u.s thing but it was a popular phone at the time it was a slider phone let me look it up um yeah it might be familiar but that was my first phone Oh, okay. It kind of looks like an iPod almost. It's got like a yeah click wheel looking thing on the design. front. Yeah, it's all soft keys. It wasn't a click wheel, but um, yeah, my first one was a chocolate. Um, then I had a Motorola Crazer, um, which was like their smaller version of the Razer, um, which was also a really popular phone for a while. Um, then I had some like cheap feature phones, uh, that were like no name or if, if they had a name, it was a series of numbers and letters. It wasn't anything fancy. Uh, I had a Samsung blackjack two, which I think was my first smartphone. And that came out, um, the phone came out in 2007, the same time as the iPhone, but I had it many years later. Uh, and then after that, my first iPhone was iPhone five. Ah, uh, okay. Yep. So, and then I was, uh, I jumped around a lot, especially during that time on iPhone five. I really preferred windows phone. Uh, I, I had one windows phone in my history. I had like when feature phones, whatever you call them, uh, were becoming a thing. Um, I got an mm-hmm. HTC windows phone six, I guess. I enjoyed showing off its features to everyone else who just had like dumb phones like 
dumb Nokia bricks, but uh, it was not <laughs> yeah not that great a device all the same. <laughs> uh, yeah, I really like Windows Phone Seven and Windows Phone Ten. I think were actually I like they were really refreshing to me compared to the other phone interfaces, the live tiles and. Uh, I liked the the inky black because OLED was really popular in Windows Phone, but and they lacked a start menu though. I mean, if you use the older Windows phones, like my my Blackjack Two had a start menu. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, back when it was called like Windows Mobile or something. So, and a full keyboard and everything. So, back when we thought that was what made a phone useful. Right. Yeah, we jumped from the. Um... T9 to a lot of friends having a full hardware keyboard for a little while, like the era of of BlackBerry and the Blackjack and those sorts of phones, yeah. and then they were promptly killed by the software keyboard. Yeah, which was another thing around 2007 when when the iPhone came out. I remember Steve Ballmer laughing at the idea of it not having a physical keyboard and saying, "No one's gonna, no serious business people are gonna use this." And yeah, I think like, there was a like quote from the there. Research in Motion exec who said something similar. Um, and then yeah. and BlackBerry then hung on to their hardware keyboard for a, a long time to their demise, yeah. although they are still alive. Yeah. I think Android was the only company at the time that recognized the potential and said, oh, we need to we need, we need to pivot, and this is the future. And so that's basically why they're the only iPhone competitor around now. I took one note. I said we should talk about your, your iPhone collection, but we already did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got the original iPhone, and uh, this this collection's the first time I've ever actually held an original iPhone in my hand. Other than that, the oldest one I ever had was a 3G. Oh, wow. Um, okay. And I was, I'm really impressed by the premium feel of it, because I feel like the 3G and the 3GS being plastic didn't feel quite as premium, but the original iPhone feels really nice in the hand. Yeah, it had some, yeah, especially things like, um, I think the home button in the original iPhone was better than any of the the following home buttons all the way up until we got Touch ID. I think the, the original iPhone's home button was just, it was so nice, it was so clicky. Uh, I, as far as I know, they never tended to, to gunk up or get dirt under them like the preceding ones did. The, wait, preceding? Yeah, it still works preceding. just fine for me. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Case in point. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't think they had any sort of cracking uh, backs because the backs were, uh, they were metal for the most part, unlike right. on the 3G series. Yeah, those are very prone to aging and cracking, becoming brittle. And they sold for what, like four, or 500 bucks? That was the subsidized contract price was like five or six hundred dollars. <laughs> okay. They were insanely expensive when they launched. Oh, were they? I must be thinking of a different model then. I, I always remember the early ones being close to like that $500 mark. Mm. Yeah, well, they they were that mark. That was back when you got a contract and your phone, usually your phone was either free or like $100 on contract. Uh, but the iPhone famously was, was like $600. And Apple dropped the price by $200 a few months later uh, and made customers really upset that had already bought it and they i think they made it up by giving them the difference in an itunes gift card or something <laughs> okay uh, i think we must have had a different slightly different setup here though because i remember that the outright non-contract cost usually being around that 500 dollars, uh, and then if you got it really? on contract the total phone price often ended up being like from 50 to at most 150 dollars hmm. yeah that definitely wasn't the case at least with the original iphone uh but uh, I don't know what the actual off-contract prices were back then. They were never really advertised because everything was <laughs> it's either on contract or nothing. The concept of buying a phone from the manufacturer directly was completely foreign. And you look at contract phone prices these days and you just end up paying the entire outright purchase price of the phone <laughs> over two years instead. Yeah, yeah the monthly payments kind of has completely gone away with uh if you sign it because the idea of of signing a two-year contract is completely gone away as well though so now it's everything is month by month and you can drop your plan whenever you want uh i mean unless you're 
leasing a phone, and then you got to pay the difference you have left on your phone before you can cancel your contract. Should we talk about Memoji? Yeah. Meme. Xiaomi. Is that right? Xiaomi? Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> Xiaomi clones Apple's Memoji with new Memoji avatars. And <laughs> this is interesting to me because, I mean, they are completely ripping off Apple's Memoji, uh, uh, but not to the extent that it sounds initially. Exactly. Because Xiaomi was using Memoji before Apple was. Yeah, they had the name first. <laughs> yeah. But, so when Apple launched the iPhone X and Animoji, Xiaomi copied Animoji and had their own animal face tracking avatars and they called those Memoji. And then Apple the next year announced Memoji and that was actually like your face in a customizable avatar. And Xiaomi is just catching up to that and now copying that part and keeping their Memoji branding. So the name isn't a rip off, but the features still are. If it wasn't a company that had a strong history of ripping off everything that Apple did, then I would maybe have a little bit of sympathy for them. But considering it's Xiaomi, um, who <laughs> who copied down to like really fine details, like they really sweat the details on copying things that Apple have made, then yeah, it's hard to have sympathy, even when it appears that Apple has kind of taken their name and changed it one letter instead of M-I, M-E at the start of the word. Um, I love the uh, the press release that Xiaomi made mm-hmm. saying, we have conducted internal audits and found no evidence that our Memoji characters have been plagiarized from any of our competitors, including Apple. <laughs> wow. I wonder if they said the same thing about the, the Mi phone or whatever their iPhone 10 <laughs> replica is. Yeah. <laughs> I think even a lot of their software is like a glyph glyph ripoff of Apple's. Yeah. I mean, I don't think there's any Xiaomi phones being sold in the US. At least I've never seen any. But I'm sure if they were, Apple would, would be able to block them immediately. Uh, but in markets like China, where there's not much consideration for uh, copyright law they can get away with it so the head of PR at Xiaomi said there's a functional logic difference between the uh, that that the functional product that the functional logic difference between the two products is huge and he's also promised the next phase of action against people who report it as copying uh, without posting proof (laughs) without proof is uh (laughs) A, a bit of a weird thing because you literally just take a screenshot of both and put them side by side and you can see that they're nearly identical. I mean, yeah. down to the colors, I mean, down to the hat styles, yeah. down to the facial accessories, it is literally a copy. Yeah. I mean, the statement that these aren't copies because we wrote the code differently under the hood, uh, but they still do the exact same thing and look the same. And yeah, we wrote way. our own code, and that's just how it turned out at the end. You know, what, what do you mean we copied them? We wrote the code we completely no differently. What the code does. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, what can you do? Yeah, I don't know much more to say about that. No, me either. I actually okay. don't know what um, what you can do. I mean, does Apple pursue like copyright cases in China, or is it more of a let's worry about I the mean, US market? And yeah, China is famously like has no enforcement of copyright laws, um, so there's nothing they can do about a Chinese company selling phones in Chinese markets. They can they can. If they, I don't know what the copyright, their copyright on this stuff looks like, but they can definitely, like, bring it to court in other markets that they're potentially selling these phones in. Uh, I'm not sure where they're being sold, if they're even being sold outside of the Chinese market. Uh, but they could definitely do it in like European markets, and uh, 
the U.S. if they're being sold here. Although yeah, I don't even know if it's worth going after for Apple. Yeah, I've, I've no concept of how big Xiaomi is in, uh, as a, a phone manufacturer in China. There are certainly tons of Xiaomi, other Xiaomi products in Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, w- one of the commenters pointed out that they've got a really nice umbrella by Xiaomi. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I didn't know they made non-tech stuff. I wonder who they ripped off the umbrella design from. <laughs> <laughs> um man but i mean samsung has a similar feature to memoji as well um it's a little different and a little creepier looking it's a lot but, uh, creepier looking <laughs> i mean apple hasn't bothered to say anything about that and samsung is probably their biggest competitor in terms of physical devices so, I don't think they're worried. I don't think anyone's going to uh, send these creepy looking things to their friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's unfair. I haven't seen it since the launch. I'm sure it's improved. Yeah, you'd hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah it really that's would. That's a good observation. I haven't seen any. Like, I see Memoji around quite a bit, but I have not seen any of the Samsung equivalent anywhere ever. <laughs> no, maybe it's just because we're stuck in our own little bubbles of like Apple community, and there is like a Samsung community where people post them all the time. Or maybe they're still just terrible and not <laughs> worth posting. I don't know. Um, maybe. Uh, you know what I really like about um, iOS 13 is the little uh, emoji that have made out of your own uh, Memoji. They're really nice. Have you used the uh, Bitmoji app? Um, yeah, I think I've used it. Yeah, but, uh, not extensively. Nah, it just It's a similar, reminds me of that functionality at least where you can create a character that looks like you and then send that character emoting different things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You could probably also do that in um, uh, Chibi Studio, right? Uh, yeah, I'm sure you can if you wanted to make a Chibi look like you. Uh, that's not something I've ever tried to do, but yeah, with how infinitely customizable they are, I'm sure you could make one that looks like you. Uh, this next one... Apple Computer's 1987 vision for the future. Uh, and so this is a, a video that Apple published in, in 87, uh, which allegedly showed what technology looked like in approximately 2011. And it showed this tablet device with a smart assistant on it um, that you could basically ask to do anything. Like, hey, call this person, and they call it which is a simple task, but you could also say, like, generate me uh, a graphic of, I think the example was, like, how the rainforest changed in Brazil between these two dates, um, which is a lot more advanced. Uh, but I remember seeing this video in 2011 because it coincided with the release of the iPad 2 and Siri coming out, uh, or at least being integrated into Apple products. And surprisingly close in terms of functionality to what Apple predicted um, 30 years prior, almost 25 years prior. Uh, So it's kind of cool to see how spot on they were. Yeah, they got a few things right and a few things wrong. Basically, the the main part they got wrong is how well a computer could interpret uh, just natural speaking and sort of do tasks with you and pull data from the internet. Um, Mm Mm-hmm. But like you know, the, the data is there now. I'm not sure how realistic that was in in '87 to be able to just like get that information from the internet. But yeah, that's certainly doable. Just just not by asking. <laughs> and the, the other, the really quaint part I found was that the virtual assistant was actually like a a, a real life like human on the screen who would talk back to you in almost like a video call. <laughs> <laughs> Very quaint. Right. I th- yeah, that, that's definitely like something we could do if if companies thought that that would be received well or people wanted that. We could definitely make our virtual assistants look like a person talking. But I think that would end up coming off maybe more creepy than charming. Yeah, I think we might still be in the uncanny valley when it comes to that sort of thing. And they're not going to look quite good enough right, to really pull it off. <laughs> uh, but yeah, a lot of the features that they they did predict in this video 
uh, definitely came to fruition right about the same time. Uh, FaceTime? Like in this, in this, yeah, exactly. The video conferencing, which what's also came out in 2010. Um, it was a very similar implementation. Uh, PDX stoned note from the comments notes that the biggest thing they got wrong is about how he just left the device on his desk and then went to lunch without it. Whereas, of course, oh yeah, you would just pick it up and put it in your pocket or put it in your bag, even in 2011. Yeah, it was a little unwieldy. Like It was like about the size of a laptop, but it <laughs> something else that's more of an even more modern invention. It had a folding screen. Right. <laughs> With a massive hinge. <laughs> right. <laughs> But yeah, it was basically a laptop that, or a clamshell tablet, I guess, because it, it just looked like a laptop closed. But then upon opening it, was a very large tablet. What was the purpose of releasing this video? Was it part of anything? I didn't really look too deeply into it. Uh, I think it was just, yeah, I didn't look deeply into it either. I assumed it was just an Apple, like, this is what we're going to be doing in 25 years kind of video. But, uh, yeah, maybe there was some specific, uh, uh, reason they, they made it like for a, like a developer conference or something similar. I don't know if they had developer conferences back then, but maybe even like a shareholder meeting, like, look, this is what we're working towards. You know, if you took this entire video and replaced the, the device with more like a, Minority Report glass with transparencies and floating pieces and panels, but took took the exact same uh, interaction. Like the man spoke word for word and say said, "This is what the future is going to be in twenty forty." Mm-hmm. What do you think? Do you do you think we in twenty forty we'll be able to speak as naturally as he does to a computer and and get results out of it? I I think so. I think Siri is not a good example of this, but like the Google Assistant is able to handle complex queries fairly well. Uh, and the idea of it being able to manipulate and act on the data it gets back is, yeah, that's is the crux of like it, a logical it? next step. Mm. Yeah. Because you can say, like, find me a report on the rainforest data for the last 20 years and Google Assistant could do that. Now the idea of take that data and do something with it, I think is what we're going to see in the next decade or so. Right. It would probably have to like pass through like a a PDF file and then work out what (laughs) data is relevant to what your question was. And I imagine it would be horrendously complex unless there's some sort of, I don't just making stuff up now, like a a uniform (laughs) data structure for, for everything <laughs> that computers could read um, instead of just what we have now, which is just people putting words on a page and then arbitrary graphs. Right. Now, your concept of this being done in like a minority report display style, I think I think we're going to see more of like an augmented reality. Like people are all going to be wearing AR glasses or some kind of equivalent device where you don't have to look at a phone to do it, but you don't have to have this big setup that's projecting data everywhere either. Or at least it's kind of projecting data, but just for you to see. Right, yeah. It's going to be uh, Edith, is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got that reference? Nope, but I'm going to pretend I did for <laughs> the show. <laughs> the, um, okay, go ahead. What the, is it? The glasses that Iron Man wears. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I'm not sure if it's got a name in in Iron Man movies, but it's called Edith, um, at least in the new Spider-Man okay. movie. I, I can only reference this because I saw the movie last night, so it's very fresh in my mind. Huh. But yeah, it is... Uh, they're AR glasses, basically. Incredibly complex AR glasses that draws on the power of the internet. And of course, in the movie, Tony Stark's entire galactic <laughs> uh, satellite network. Huh. I'm excited to see that movie. I have yet to see it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. This is... It sounds like another time for James to do his famous synopsis. 
famous completely spoiler free synopsis where I just kind of <laughs> that's right bumble over words for two minutes and try and give an impression of the movie without giving anything away. <laughs> yeah. It's no Infinity War, but it's a solid Spider Man movie. That's good. I'll leave it at that. I'm excited. That's a, that's a, a great synopsis. <laughs> <laughs> all right well i'm jelly woot on reddit and twitter uh, and i'm james vdm on reddit and on twitter all right and i just realized this show is going up on the fourth of july uh okay what does that mean independence day sure. yeah it's our independence day I just remembered that because there's fireworks going off outside of my house. <laughs> so, and I was I was really confused. It sounded like there was like someone like stomping around upstairs. I'm like, what's going on? And I pulled up my cameras on my phone. <laughs> like, there's no one up there. What is that thumping? <laughs> the Fourth of July. <laughs> Do you know what Independence Day means to a non? What does it mean? Yeah. What What does What do I think of? when i hear the words independence day i would assume that that in australia you guys would have a similar meaning to us since you also became independent of the you like great britain at some point yeah we, is that not what that means we don't have anything called independence day though oh okay so what does it mean to you there's this really good movie from 1996 starring will smith and jeff goldberg oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it means to you. That's all it means to me. Sorry. It was a so, great movie. So you guys don't celebrate any kind of Independence Day? Oh, no. We we have um, Australia Day, we call it, on the um, uh, okay. 26th of January. I guess that makes sense, because Canada celebrates Canada Day. And that was, I don't know, like a week ago? Mm-hmm. Theirs, theirs is really close to ours, so. Mm-hmm. Huh. But there you go. It's just a movie to me. Sorry. Okay, that's fair. I guess I didn't know. Like, I mean, it's obviously common knowledge here that the Fourth of July is Independence Day, but I don't know how knowledgeable other people are of U.S. holidays. So, uh, not terribly, no. <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, and probably even less so, um, vice versa. I would say. Yeah, I don't know. A single holiday that that you would yeah celebrate. see i bet i could name a couple of yours but i bet you could sure. name none of mine you could probably guess uh, some though i could guess so that they're, they're like obvious names oh ah, yeah probably i mean you said australia day already uh-huh yeah i'm not giving you that one though do you have some kind of indigenous people's day uh, no sadly not no um man uh, an australia specific holiday I mean that some are Australia specific and some are just like specific to things that happen in every country or like that every country celebrates. I mean, I know that you just had a similar like a Veterans Day kind of thing. But I don't think ah, uh, there you Veterans go. Veterans Day. Uh huh. Yep. Is it? Um. Uh. So do you have like a President's Day? You have a Prime Minister, right? We do. We have a Prime Minister, but no, he doesn't. Well, have yeah, a day. our day isn't for current presidents. It's like to celebrate past presidents like it's between george washington and abraham lincoln's birthdays uh, who do we have above the prime minister there's your clue you have someone above the prime minister uh-huh i have no clue do you guys still recognize the queen as above exactly the prime minister? bingo really uh-huh so, we have a... so you guys we oh, celebrate the queen's holiday? birthday that's a public holiday oh okay i guess canada does as well so that makes sense um. Uh, your, your guess of the um, like the Veterans Day we have Anzac Day which is uh-huh. Australian New Zealand Army Corps Day just as a uh-huh. yeah remembering the wars right do you have so we have a few different ones we have ones for people who are veterans we have Veterans Day for that we have Memorial Day for people who died fighting in the armed forces do you have anything like a memorial day uh no the anzac day is the only uh day like that oh, okay it kind of is that though though it's a combination of the both right okay 
Um, hmm. We have Flag Day. Do you have a Flag Day? No, I don't know what that is. <laughs> I don't know what it is more than the fact that, like, Boy Scout troops go around and stick little American flags everywhere. And everyone gets a day off for that? Uh, no, that's not normally a day off holiday. Okay. Now, we should keep I, it to I day guess. off holidays because there are probably like a million okay. holidays that aren't day off holidays. I mean, like, you've got free donut day, free cheesecake day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the the only uh, other day I can think of that's that's not like a New Year's or a Christmas or an Easter or something is um, just the state holiday as well, Western Australia Day. Um, oh. Which is kind of, I guess, Australia Day, but a little more specific to the state I live in. Uh, but besides that, that's that's it, I think. Okay, let's see. Um, I'm actually, one of the now. states here has a, a holiday for a horse race, the Melbourne Cup. That's a little different. You have eight hours day? Uh, oh, yeah, I might have missed that one. Uh, that Labor Day, um, the, celebrating the eight-hour work day. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, I forgot about Labor Day. That's a good one. Uh, picnic day? <laughs> You're just making things up now? No, I'm I'm on the Wikipedia for public holidays in Australia. Okay. Um, it's, maybe it's, that's pic, not pic, specific to my state. I've never heard of that before. It sounds picnic terrible. Picnic day is a public holiday Actually, it sounds in amazing. the Northern Territory. It takes ah, place okay. every year on the first Monday of August. The Northern Territory is not a very populous area of Australia. The Queen's birthday is celebrated on different days. Uh-huh. Nearly every state has a different day to choose it, to <laughs> celebrate it. <laughs> yeah, there's like five different days it's celebrated. It's like wherever we can fit it amongst our own public holidays. <laughs> Boxing Day? Ah, uh, that's the day after Christmas, the 26th. Right. But what does that mean? What's Boxing Day? Just It's just an extra day off? But why is it called Boxing Day? Uh, it's something to do with all the boxes that are left over from Christmas presents. I'm pretty sure it has nothing to do with fighting. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> proclamation Day? Yeah, never heard of that either. So Proclamation Day is the name of official or unofficial holidays or other anniversaries which commemorate the mark and important proclamation. So it's just general day to celebrate any important proclamations that were made? That's Interesting. Weird. Which state holds that? I need to know. It doesn't say the state, unfortunately. Um, Looks like it's in South Australia, another smallish state, mm-hmm. but okay, they they do their own thing there. Recreation Day. It's in Northern Tasmania. Northern Tasmania? That's getting really specific. You sure it's not Northern <laughs> Territory? <laughs> no, it says Northern Tasmania. <laughs> okay. Let's take a small state and then isolate just one area of it and we'll have a little holiday there. Yeah, Melbourne Cup is on there. Uh, Royal Queensland Show. Yeah, we're getting very specific uh, here to state. Just in Queensland. Yeah, okay. Well, consider yourself educated. 